So when I'm Dr. Kelly Morgan, I am the medical director for Las Vegas Fire and Rescue. I am an emergency physician here, and 12 months ago, I knew nothing about opiate use disorders. I'm going to be 100% honest. All I knew is that people showed up in the ER, and we gave them Narcan and said, good luck, have at it. This is not an ER problem. So I will tell you from firsthand experience that my view on this has, has kind of come full circle in the last 12 months. And what we really wanted to do is start to kind of build coalitions of people who are starting to have better understandings of the problem, get problem solvers in the room, and like let's really talk about solutions because we can do this as a community in Las Vegas. And so what we wanted to do is invite everybody to the conversation and kind of give people who maybe weren't as aware of, of some of the trends and, and how ERs are being used to treat opiate use disorders and what that needs to look like, give you an introduction, and then we're gonna bring in some other people. We've got a handful of um, panelists, myself included, to, um, to have the discussion about what's already being done in the city of Las Vegas, where have these types of programs been successful? How can we rip off and duplicate things? And then like, how do we tweak it to make it our own? So without further ado, I would love to introduce Dre Cantwell Frank. She is the, that's like a huge mouthful guys. I'm she sorry. is, she <laughs> is um, one of the program directors for Bridge to Treatment, which started out as California Bridge. Um, and I got a chance to work with Dre last year um, and she opened my eyes to opiates. So she is gonna come and talk to us very well about, um, about kind of what opiate use treatment looks like in the emergency department and how they've been successful. And then we're gonna open it up for a panel um, as soon as my other two get here after their meeting. All right, take it away. <laughs> Did everybody do the pre-presentation survey? Just takes a quick second, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kelly, and thank you everyone for coming. It's an honor to be here and to talk about this work. So I really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. As Kelly said, I'm Dre Cantwell-Frank, and I work for Bridge uh, with their national team implementing training and technical assistance for emergency departments around the country for using medication, for initiating medication for opioid use disorder in, the, in emergency departments. <clears throat> Bridge is a program of the F Public Health Institute and our mission is to integrate emergency medicine and public health, community health, in a way that improves health outcomes and creates health equity for all people. Oh, also, this is my disclosure, which I, I have none. Um, uh, we're a mission-driven nonprofit, so nobody pays me to say the things that we say. We do it because we believe in it. And the, um, also, any mentions of trade names or brands are purely incidental, and please don't mistake those for endorsements. So fentanyl driving overdose deaths is not new news to anyone in this room. We all know that the opioid crisis is here and has been here for a long time. But every time I see this slide and look at the reality that from 1999 to 2021, the number of deaths associated with synthetic opioid overdose grew 97 fold. It doesn't matter how many times I hear that statistic, it's truly staggering. And I want to take a second here to talk about why I got into this work and why I'm standing here today to talk with all of you. So I'm a paramedic by training. I've been in healthcare for over 18 years. Um, and I was running on an ambulance in Portland when the really powerful fentanyl started hitting the streets. And it was like nothing we had ever seen before. People were dying at unprecedented rates. Young, healthy people were in my ambulance with overdoses and it was just, it was really intense. And then from there, I moved back to Alaska, which is where I went to paramedic school. And I was running um, the emergency medicine program for a tribal health organization in remote Alaska. And the geographic area that we served was about the size of Ohio. And we had, we were the de facto critical access hospital for that entire area without actually being a hospital. We're, so we didn't really have the resources we needed and we were a long way from definitive care. Um, and honestly, as I, I look around this room, I, I think I have more providers in here than were in the state of Alaska total the entire time I was there. Um, which is great because if something happens tonight, um, if there's an emergency, I don't have to deal with it for once. So that's, that, that works for me. Um, seriously though, it was, it was intense work and really challenging, lots of minimal resources and high acuity patients. 
And then COVID happened. <clears throat> and this was, of course, during the time that there was still an X waiver for buprenorphine um, for medication, for assist medication assisted treatment. And for that area that was that is the size of the state of Ohio, we had one wavered provider to take care of all of our MAT patients. And one day her kid got sick and it was COVID. And because it was Alaska, she didn't have phone service or internet at home. She went home to quarantine for two weeks. And in that two week period, three of her MAT patients who did not have access to buprenorphine another way died of an overdose. And in that moment, well, so I got into medicine through wilderness medicine, search and rescue. That's how I got started in EMS. And in that realm, our mantra is no one dies a preventable death. And in that moment, I realized that overdose is a preventable death and we need to do better. Shortly after that, I found my way to Bridge and I've been working, as I said, around the country to help emergency departments implement emergency department medication for opioid use disorder. So we talked about the opioid crisis and it's not like we didn't do something about it. You know, we changed our practice. We changed the way that we were administering medication. Um, opioid prescriptions were declined. As you can see here on this chart, unfortunately that wasn't enough. And as we reduced the number of opioid prescriptions that we were writing, overdose deaths increased. And some people will tell you that that's because we, we have this, the, the faucet running and we turned it off for millions of people who had become dependent on opioids and then they, their access to a safe supply was cut off and they looked to a more dangerous, a more dangerous drug supply to, for, for opioids because they couldn't get them anymore. As of today, about 46 million Americans, which is roughly 15% of the population, has, an op has a substance use disorder. Broken down another way, that's one in 15 Americans struggle with substance use disorder. In spite of its prevalence, 94, and this is from SAMHSA, 94% of people in the United States with an opioid use disorder have not received any treatment within the last year for that substance use disorder. And of those people who did receive treatment, a very small percentage received evidence-based medication. So why? Why are people not getting treatment? We've, we hear from our patients about the long distance to treatment options. We hear about the long wait times to be accepted into a program. But a couple of the biggest things that we run into are the, the ways that we as healthcare providers have really gotten in our own way. And one of those things is, is the stigma that is associated with substance use disorder. It's the only chronic medical condition that's treated as a moral failing instead of, of a, a, a medical condition that's treatable and that people can recover from. Additionally, the, the healthcare system has set all kinds of barriers ahead of people who are trying to seek care. Instead of just, you have a substance use disorder, let's give you medication and get you started on that, we require people to sign abstinence contracts. We, decide, we require people to submit to regular urine tox screens. And, and, and all of that in a moment when they're in crisis. Could you imagine if somebody came into your emergency department in a diabetic emergency, and before you stabilized their blood sugar, you said, well, we're, we're going to have you sign this contract that says that you'll never eat a donut ever again. That would, be, that, that would never make sense, and it would never happen. But that is what we do to people with substance use disorder every single day. Another thing we've learned uh, in the work that we've done is that detox doesn't last. And when I first got into medicine, short-term inpatient detox was one of the primary options. And it still is one of the primary options that we send people to, you know, and that was the belief, that was my belief that, all right, you just have to get through the, you know, the rough couple days. After all, you know, the, the symptoms of withdrawal can't kill you. So, I mean, that's, that's what I was told by healthcare educators. And that's, I've even said that to patients before, before I knew better. But detox, as you can see here, that the detox over the, the number of patients still abstaining from drugs d decreases dramatically in a number of days with inpatient detox alone. So what about counseling? And I, I want to be clear here. I think counseling is a 
very important thing for a lot of the, a lot of the challenges that our patients face. And it is, it, it's a really important part of, healing, of the healing journey for a lot of people. However, specifically for opioid use disorder, a study came out at the end of last year where somebody wanted to look at what was really effective and what was helping people with opioid use disorder. And they looked at 305 studies of almost 55,000 patients over the course of nearly 50 years. And this is what they found. Scant evidence is available on the rehabilitative effects of psychosocial interventions either as a standalone treatment or in, as an adjunct to medication. So again, I'm not saying counseling doesn't have its place, but if you're trying to get serious about saving people from overdose, we have to try a different approach. This is another study that was done in Connecticut around, this, around the same time that that retrospective came out. And this was a retrospective study of op opioid overdose deaths. So they looked at people with a substance use disorder and how likely they were to die. And they looked at whether or not the person was in treatment of any kind for opioid use disorder. And they looked at what kind of treatment they received. And what they found was that the risk of death was reduced with medication for opioid use disorder as compared to no treatment, as well as compared to non-medication non interventions. In their conclusion, they went even further. And they said that it is also clear that the risk of death is associated with exposure to non-MOUD forms of treatment was no less than for people who received no treatment of, at all. In fact, non-MOUD treatment might have produced a worse outcome than no treatment. And that really relates back to the stigma that people think. They think that when other things aren't working, that there's something wrong with them. Because after all, the detox is supposed to work. The counseling is supposed to work. And when it doesn't, people feel like they, they've failed and they give up. So at, at Bridge, long before I started working there, we took all of, they took all this information and all of this evidence that medication is an effective treatment for opioid use disorder and decided to try a new approach and administer buprenorphine in the emergency department right in the moment when people needed it. Now, I do want to say really quick, I understand that buprenorphine is not the only medication available to treat addiction. And I'm in, I'm in no way trying to knock methadone. It is a life-saving medication that helps many people. I'm going to focus on buprenorphine today because it is a medication that is much easier to implement in the emergency department. And it also has, because it's less restrictive and has a better safety profile, it has less of an impact on people's daily lives. You're not having to go to a clinic every single day to get medication. Again, I, for some people, methadone is a wonderful medication, and I'm not trying to say that it's not. So let's talk about buprenorphine as a medication. So buprenorphine does three things. It treats withdrawal, it, teach, it treats craving, and it protects from overdose. And it does this because of a few different, very unique characteristics. First of all, it is the only opioid that exists that is a partial agonist opioid. So you can see on this chart here that the full agonists that we're used to, um, the heroin, fentanyl, morphine, any of those, as you all know, the more that you give, the, the more you increase respiratory depression all the way to apnea. The same thing doesn't happen with buprenorphine because of that partial agonist effect. So after, as you increase the dose, the, resp the respiration rate of your patient remains constant. That's what makes it so life-saving and gives it such a great safety profile. Um, interestingly, that ceiling effect, that no ceiling effect, um, that ceiling effect does not appear to apply to analgesia. So that is how it is so effective at treating those, uh, those really uncomfortable signs and symptoms that our, that our patients are experiencing along with their withdrawal. The other, another reason that makes buprenorphine incredibly effective is its high affinity for the mu receptor. It has such a high affinity that it will outcompete any other opioids in a patient's system. It even outcompetes naloxone, interestingly, so we can talk about the combo product and the implications for that um, during the discussion. But it has such a high affinity that it will knock off and displace any other opioid that's in your patient's system. And the third thing that combines with that to really make it a remarkable medication is its long half-life. So unlike naloxone, which reverses which, which can re reverse overdose, but only lasts about five minutes before you have to re-administer. 
Buprenorphine has a, lap, a half life of 24 to 36 hours, meaning that at adequate doses, when you give your patient buprenorphine in the emergency department, you've just bought them 24 to 36 hours, 48 hours even, where their airway is protected because any opioid that they leave your emergency department and ingest is not going to be able to bind to those mu receptors and you've just given them two days of clear thinking and the ability to feel what it feels like to not experience the cravings and the withdrawals that they've become so used to. Here's another look at the ceiling on respiratory depression. Um, and here it's compared to fentanyl, which again, we've all seen as the dosage goes up, the respiration rate goes down with buprenorphine. After a couple of milligrams, it stays constant and you don't see the respiratory depression. And this is true even in really high doses of buprenorphine. Um, some of my colleagues, Dr. Andrew Herring and Josh Luftig and some others at Highland Hospital in Oakland, California, had a study that was recently published in JAMA. And they looked at what at the time they were calling high dose buprenorphine. And it's not uncommon for them in their emergency department and other emergency departments I work in to be giving 16, 24, 36, 64 milligrams of buprenorphine. And this holds true. High dose is safe. And Josh, who I was just talking about, has a story that he loves to tell when he shares this slide, which is that he had a patient um, come into his emergency department having taken their entire 30-day supply of buprenorphine. It was an attempted overdose. They took 30 days worth all at once and then came to the emergency department and the only thing they were experiencing was confusion. They were walking around confused that nothing else had happened to them because this is someone who was experienced with a lot of different drugs over a lot of years and they understood the basic principle that we think of with drugs, which is the more you take, the more effects you have. This didn't happen with this patient. And the punchline is, when they discharged the patient, what did, what did they do for them? They, they gave them some fluids, they let them rest, they discharged him with another 30 days worth of buprenorphine because that was what the patient needed and that was what was gonna keep him alive. So with all of this, as I said, Bridge decided to take this to emergency departments on a larger scale and see what happens. In June 2018, they started with six hospitals around California where we use this model of medication first. You come in, you've experienced an overdose or you're in withdrawal, you get medication, and then we go from there. And what happened was very quickly it scaled up to 20 hospitals, then 50, then 100. And by 2021, 276 of the 300 hospitals in the state of California were using this model. And what happened was that we had over 300,000 patient encounters for substance use disorder. 241,000 patients were identified with opioid use disorder. MAT was prescribed or administered almost 100,000 times. And almost 200,000 naloxone kits were ordered by and sent out into the community by hospitals that we work, that we work with. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, why start in the emergency department? Could this really fall to us? Like, we're already doing all the things in there. We're already exhausted. We're already overworked. So why start from the emergency department? We live in a day and age where, unfortunately, many people in this country, the emergency department is their only access to healthcare. Just before this presentation, I learned that Nevada it ranks 48th for access to primary care in the country. So if you need a primary care doctor, Nevada ranks 48th, so people are coming to the emergency department for care. It's also the only place that's open 24-7 when crisis happens. And so we are a perfect place to, to treat patients when they're in crisis and when they're in that moment when they want help and want to do something different. Additionally, <clears throat> opioid use disorder is an emergency. In, from 2011 to 2015, a study was done in Massachusetts, and they looked at the one-year mortality rate post-visit to the emergency department for a non-fatal overdose. So people who were brought in, revived with naloxone, they looked at their one-year mortality rate. And it was about 5.5%, which is roughly the same as a STEMI. So that in and of itself is interesting, but it gets even more compelling. Of those patients that died, 20% of them died in the first month. And of those that died in the first month, 
22% died in the first two days. Now remember what we were just talking about with buprenorphine, that it gives that 36 to 48 hours of airway protection? That right there was enough to make me realize and make me feel like this is something, that an intervention that absolutely has to happen in the emergency department. But I mean, what if we just made our referral process better? What if we just made it faster to get people to a follow-up clinic? And instead of those long wait times, what if we found a way to fix that? Well, our friend Gail D'Onofrio at Yale asked that question in a, random clinic, a randomized clinical trial where she looked at the retention in treatment for patients uh, who were started on buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. And she compared two groups of patients. The first group was patients who were started in the emergency department, and the second group were patients who were started at a follow-up clinic one or two days later. So within that one or two day window. And this is what she found. The group that was started in the emergency department, 78% were still in treatment 30 days later. Again, back to that two days, one month, one year post-mortality, 78% were still in treatment after 30 days. As compared to the people where we waited just one or two days, 37% of those patients were still in treatment 30 days later. Another compelling statistic, I think, is the number needed to treat for buprenorphine. There is not a person in this country, probably, that doesn't think of aspirin when they think of heart attacks. And the number needed to treat for aspirin and a STEMI is 42. Warfarin and AFib, 25. These are gold standard interventions that everybody knows and everybody uses. The number needed to treat for buprenorphine and opioid use disorder is two to retain in treatment. So you start two people on buprenorphine in your emergency department and you've saved one life. We wanted to make this as easy as possible to do it in the emergency department. So through the course of scaling out in California and now around the country for the last several years, we've developed an algorithm for, initiating, for identifying patients and initiating BUP in the emergency department. And we're gonna dig into this more, but I wanted to show you that this exists as we talk through some of the barriers and, dig in, and then we'll dig into the algorithm here in a second. Because first I wanna talk about some of the myths, misconceptions, and concerns. Um, I've been doing this work around the country. We've worked in uh, almost, we've worked in 40 some states at this point, providing technical assistance and training in emergency departments and hospitals. And we're by no means gonna talk about all of the myths and misconceptions about MAT buprenorphine, but I do wanna talk about a couple of the things that come up pretty often. The first one is precipitated withdrawal. There is a lot of fear about precipitated withdrawal, and right, rightly so. It's a pretty un, un, uncomfortable experience for everybody involved. Patients are afraid of it. They'll come in and they'll say things like, oh no, I've had buprenorphine before, I'm allergic to it, I, I don't want that stuff. Uh, clinicians either have a story of giving it and watching somebody get worse, or they certainly have a peer that they know of that they've given buprenorphine and a patient hasn't gotten better. But I wanna talk about the statistics because in all reality, of patients who are started on buprenorphine, less than 1%, it's just barely less, so really it's about 1% of patients are actually go into precipitated withdrawal. And that's according to the National Institute on Drug Abuse and a, an exhaustive study that they've done. Um, and so why is this happening? How is it happening? Generally speaking, it's too little bup, so too small of a dose, and too soon of a dose before the patient has entered into adequate withdrawal. And what does it look like? It looks like what it looks like when somebody gets Narcan. Naloxone induced withdrawal is it's withdrawal that we've precipitated either in the field or in the hospital. And it's very, there's not a person in the room that doesn't know withdrawal is happening. More, what's much more common is this undertreated withdrawal. The reason for that is because traditionally in the inpatient setting or in the pre fentanyl era, the dosage for buprenorphine was two milligrams, four milligrams, and that was sufficient. And so when we started giving buprenorphine in those types of doses in the fentanyl era, people were not getting better and their withdrawal as they sit in their, in their bed in the emergency department or in the waiting room or in the hallway where we're practicing medicine or whatever it is, 
their withdrawal is naturally getting worse, and the bup can't quite keep up. And so that under-treated withdrawal has, making people, has made people very hesitant because they're worried that they're seeing precipitated withdrawal. Under-treated withdrawal is a much more like, if, if you're looking at a patient and you're like, gosh, are, are they getting better? Are they, are they getting worse? Are they just agitated because they've been here for four hours? Like what's, what's going on? That's probably a patient that you're seeing under-treated withdrawal. And again, the, the precipitated withdrawal, it's aggressive, it's, it's loud, it's uncomfortable. The person in the room next to them knows that they're in withdrawal. It is, it, there's no question. So back to that um, algorithm. How do we prevent precipitated withdrawal? How do we minimize the chance that's, that that's going to happen and keep our patients out of that 1%? So this is the, the, the steps that we've found to be most effective in our hospitals in California as well as other places around the country where we've worked. Step one is you're going to look for two clear objective signs not attributable to something else. Things like dilated pupils, goosebumps, vomiting, tachycardia, yawning and runny nose. I love these symptoms because very rarely are you going to see these in tandem and not be withdrawal. So if you're seeing those signs, you can be pretty confident that your patient is in significant enough withdrawal to start bup. The second thing to do is ask, you, ask the patient. Your patient knows their cycle of withdrawal. They're gonna know when they're in significant withdrawal. So it's a great moment to have that conversation with them and say, I have a medication that can make you feel a whole lot better, but we need to make sure that you're in significant or severe withdrawal before we give it. Where in the spectrum of your withdrawal that you've experienced before does this fall? And they will tell you. And they, that will also really create a, a collaborative trust building moment with your patient because they know that you have their best interests at heart. If you're looking for more confirmation, you, you can use a COWS score, and, and that, that doesn't necessarily hurt anything. I, the, the problem with the COWS score is it has some pretty subjective criteria. And if five of us were to do a COWS on the same patient, we'd probably come back with five different numbers. So if you want to use it for confirmation, that, that doesn't hurt anything. But what I'm, we're really hesitant to use that as your primary indicator that it's time to start view. This is probably the most common question we get around the country is it, we already have too much to do. Our beds in the emergency department are full of patients waiting for a bed in the hospital that doesn't exist and isn't going to for days, right? We're practicing medicine in the lobby. The parking lot has become the waiting room and you want us to bring in all these patients? We, you want us to become a mat clinic? Like that, that doesn't make any sense. I can tell you that in our hundreds of hospitals in California, as well as all of the states that we've worked in, we just haven't seen that. We have not seen the increase in volume. And the reason for that, 28% of adult ED patients screen positive for substance use disorder. The patients are already in the emergency department. They're frequent visitors, they're already there, Oftentimes, these are patients that take an immense amount of resources. It's very challenging. And you've got security involved. It's, it's the, a lot of nurses, you have to maybe have a one-on-one a -on -one sitter in the patient's room. It takes a huge amount of resources. But if you start treating substance use disorder in the emergency department, you're effectively providing support for and treating a group of patients that are already in the building. And what's actually going to happen is that you're going to see a decrease in the number of people in your emergency department because these people aren't going to continue to come back because their problem hasn't been adequately addressed. We actually did a study on this specifically in our sites in California. And you'll see in here that it talks about navigators. So in addition to the initiation of buprenorphine in the emergency department at, at, at an, an initial emergency department visit. We also have navigators that help provide continuing care. These are peer support workers, case management type services, things like that. So with the bridge model, we actually saw a 20% reduction in readmissions by starting people on bup in the emergency department. We saw a 30% reduction in emergency department visits in our hospitals. And for the people who are interested in the bottom line, 
We saved hospitals 27% in overall costs to run their emergency department for a year because of these decreased visits. And the cost savings on these patients was an average of, seven, of over $17,000. But if you think about that, when somebody comes in and they're in withdrawal, but they don't feel like they can stay there in withdrawal, or you don't know that they can help, they don't know that you can help them with withdrawal, they come in and they say, oh, I have abdominal pain. Oh, I have back pain. So you're, you're doing labs, you're running tests, you're tying up resources. If a patient can just come in and say, I think I'm in withdrawal and I need help with that, you're skipping all of that, you're giving them medication, and you're sending them out, out the door feeling like a different person. This is probably the next most common question that comes up is what about diversion? And that's a really important question to talk about when you're talking about opioids. You know, when in our practices, we need to make sure that the medications that we are giving to people are being used for their intended purpose and that they're going to the intended person, right? Like that's just good stewardship, that's good, good medical practice. In 2019, the Journal of Sub Substance Abuse published an article. There was a group that decided to look at the reasons that people were diverting buprenorphine. So they reviewed 17 studies that involved patients who were enrolled in an MAT program and who had disclosed that at some point in their lives they had used diverted or illicit buprenorphine. This is what they found. They asked them why they were using it. 63% were using diverted buprenorphine to abstain from other drugs. 50% were using it to treat symptoms of withdrawal. Intended purpose, right? 50% for the treatment and management of pain, 33% for the management of psychiatric issues, and 2% were reported using buprenorphine as a drug of choice to get high. The study's conclusion, <clears throat> the studies in this review consistently suggest that patients using illicit buprenorphine did so to treat symptoms of opioid withdrawal and that lack of formal access to buprenorphine contributed to their illicit use. So because they couldn't get it elsewhere, they had, that's how they had to acquire it. The people who did this study aren't the only ones who think that. And in fact, the DEA, the department in charge of diversion enforcement, when they weighed in on the Comprehensive Addiction Re Recovery Act in 2016, they cited lack of adequate treatment access as a primary reason for buprenorphine diversion. So even the DEA knows that the buprenorphine that's being acquired and used illegally is by people who are honestly trying to treat substance use disorder. There's a famous uh, French field experiment that happened in France that further proves this point, uh, or further illustrates this point. Um, and that was, this happened, um, there was a significant rise um, in France in um, injection drug use, and there was a concern about the related rise of uh, blood-borne infection and things like that that were acquired as a result of needle sharing. And so to try and reduce the amount of injection drug use that was happening in France, they just flooded, flooded everywhere with buprenorphine. They took away all restrictions. Anyone could have it. It didn't cost anything. You could just, just go get it anywhere. They saturated communities. And you can see here, illustrated by the gray line, that as access to buprenorphine, as buprenorphine saturation increased in communities, people stopped dying. Overdoses dropped dramatically, directly correlated with the amount of buprenorphine that was in communities. So if diversion is happening in a community, it's a sign that there is not enough access to the medication, not that people are trying to make money or get high or, you know, it, in, in this day and age, anyone can get fentanyl anywhere. And buprenorphine is just not a drug that people are using to, to get high when, when they can do that. Another challenge that we run into, besides the myths and myth misconceptions, is stigma. And substance use disorder is an incredibly stigmatized condition. It's the only condition that we treat like a moral failing instead of a chronic medical condition. And I'll be honest, I mean, I, I'm in EMS, I've been in med medicine for 18 years, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody more salty and cynical and jaded than a paramedic who's been in healthcare for 18 years. And I've fallen into this stigma trap, running to the same houses and running codes and giving naloxone and seeing the same people day in and day out was heartbreaking and it made me very jaded. And it was very hard 
uh, to, to deal with that every day. And so I did get bitter and cynical and frustrated with my patients because I couldn't do anything to help them. That moral injury of not being able to effectively help our patients is a real thing. But that's what's so beautiful about the, being able to give patients medication that will help them is it completely changes that dynamic. Instead of these patients being challenging and heartbreaking and making you want to pull your hair out, they're some of the most rewarding, gratifying patients. When you can effectively help them, you can change the course of their lives. I've had patients come in and show me pictures of their wedding dress or talk to me about the fact that they got their, their, their kids back. It's when you can effectively treat what's really going on for somebody, it's a total game changer. And I'm proud to say that 18 years in, I still love medicine and I still love my job. And this plays a huge part in it. So how does bridge create, um, or how does bridge deal with stigma? It's by creating a model of equity and creating a welcoming culture in the hospital that doesn't stigmatize substance use and that invites patients to be able to talk openly about what's going on for them. An implementation, this is what it looks like, um, or one example. We have signs in the waiting room, signs in triage, signs at registration that say, need help with pain pills or fentanyl? Talk to me about buprenorphine. So while they're sitting in the waiting room, formulating their, all right, what complaint am I going to come up with so that I can get what I need? And then you have to play that cat and mouse game of them asking for opiates and you saying no and everyone getting mad and you know, it ending with security and yelling. People just say, like, hey, I saw your shirt and I want to talk to you about, I think I'm in withdrawal. And that happens. When people see that, it's a total game changer. And patients say things like, for the first time, I feel like I'm being treated like a human. Another thing that's very important if you want to address stigma is looking at the language that's used around the disease of substance use disorder. In 2010, Dr. John Kelly did a study where he took two groups of clinicians and he gave them a training scenario. They thought they were there for CMEs or something. And he gave them the exact, the two groups, the exact same scenario. The only difference being with one group, the patient was referred to as a substance abuser. And in the other group, the patient was referred to as a person with a substance abuse disorder. And he found sweepingly across the study that the group that was told, that got the, the substance abuser language led, led with a more punitive response and they treated the patient worse than the group that was given the language person with a substance use disorder. So the language that we use matters and it conveys to our patients that we care, it conveys to patients that we see them as human, and it also conveys to our colleagues that this is how we're going to treat this condition and it can be absolutely transformative in your practice. So we've talked about what the thing is and we've talked about the barriers to the thing. Let's talk a little bit about doing the thing. So this is a zoom in on part of our algorithm and I have a QR code for the algorithm and I can give you, I can direct you to where you can find this um, at the end of the, this talk as well. So, uh, step one, you have a patient that you think might be a candidate for buprenorphine. Step one, are they in moderate to severe, severe withdrawal? We talked about how to recognize that. And do they want help quitting illicit opioids? If so, give them 16 milligrams of buprenorphine. Just give it to them. So our starting range is 8 to 24, um, which to some people sounds like a lot because as we said, classically in the inpatient setting and in controlled environments, 2 to 4 milligrams, especially before fentanyl, became what it is today, was the accepted protocol, the accepted starting dose. The other thing that catches people off guard about this is in medicine, generally the practice is low and slow, right? If you have a medication that you think might work, you give a little bit of it, you wait and see what happens, and then if it goes okay, you give a little bit more. The problem with that is it creates a, what we call at Bridge a, the confusing dose where you have that undertreated withdrawal where it, is it helping, is it not helping? They seem like they're slowly getting worse. And so we've really found that 16 milligrams is a great place to start. So you give your 16 milligrams, step two, wait 30 minutes. Have they gotten better? Awesome. We found the problem. The bup is working. Let's give them a second dose because that'll give them that, 
that 36 to 48 hours of airway protection and that'll give them 36 to 48 hours of clear thinking and not being owned by the feelings of craving and withdrawal and, and all of those things. If not, if they're not better at, with that much bup after that amount of time, it might be time to widen your diagnosis. You might have a, an instance of polysubstance use. That, that's pretty common. You might have an instance of somebody with opioid withdrawal and COVID, opioid withdrawal and a thyroid storm, opioid withdrawal and Graves' disease. I've seen all of those things. And so if, if it's not working right away, you may have to look at this as a more complex problem. But up until this point, otherwise, this is a straightforward fast track patient. This is somebody that you can get in and out and on their way in, in a very straightforward manner. So again, undertreated withdrawal, I think we've talked about that enough. Um, but just again to highlight, that is far more common than precipitated withdrawal. And that occurs when you don't give quite enough to get to that therapeutic level to get them over to the hump to where they're feeling better. Step three. Send them on their way with a prescription and a, and a, and a discharge plan. We like to say um, to prescribe at least two weeks supply of buprenorphine for patients because people who are in chaotic drug use, they're, they're not necessarily going to make a, a next day appointment. And if you have any concern at all, just write it for 30 days. Just assume that they're going to miss their first appointment. People have court dates. People have transportation issues. Give them every opportunity to have the medication that they need. Another tip I want to point out on here is the notes to pharmacy. Because there are insurance regulations that vary by state, the way that you write the script matters, and you want to make sure that you lower the barriers for your patients as much as possible and reduce the chances of you getting a phone call from the pharmacy asking for clarification, or it gets kicked back, or your patient arrives at the pharmacy and is told your insurance isn't going to cover this. One of the ways that we get around that really successfully is to write things like, um, OK, to substitute tablets, if that's all the pharmacy has or all that Medicaid will cover. And and this is a big one, um, a combo product or mono product. So if you put in the notes that combo product or mono product is okay, then whatever their insurance is willing to cover, because it really significantly varies by insurance carrier, that's going to give a, a higher likelihood that they're going to be able to get their medication. And then, of course, give them, if you can, in hand naloxone, because as we know, 90% of naloxone prescriptions never get filled. So in hand naloxone is going to be the most effective for your patients. And another thing that's on the, um, the algorithm is this national clinician consultation warm line. So if you have a patient and you're just not sure about it and you want to phone a friend, um, you can have my card at the end of this and I can connect you with the, some of the clinicians I mentioned today. Um, you can also call this number and you can talk through specific patients and get guidance, get feedback on the appropriateness of BUP initiation. What if the patient is not yet in withdrawal, but wants to initiate MAT? Great, write them a script and send them home with a, with a self-start guide because it is that safe of a medication. And I'll tell you that in the sites we work in, we do this at least as often as we do the starts in the emergency department. Someone comes in with in withdrawal, or maybe they come in with another complaint and they see the sign on the wall that says, you can talk to me about drugs. And so they say, I would like, I would like help, I would like treatment. Great, write them a script, send them home. It talks through what they can expect in withdrawal. It talks through when it's appropriate to start and supportive measures that they can take to make the experience as un uncomfortable as possible. Another option that we're seeing that's becoming more and more common, um, both in California and around the country, is pre-hospital buprenorphine. And actually, when I was um, preparing this talk, I wanted to call it buprenorphine, so easy a paramedic can do it, because I'm paramedic. Um, and our comms team shot that down. So we ended up with the, you know, the turning crisis into opportunity uh, title, which is much better, and that's fine. Um, but seriously, um, we're doing, not only are we doing um, EMS-initiated bup, where um, services are running with buprenorphine on the trucks. But in California, they just passed an, an initiative to allow offline uh, buprenorphine with offline medical direction. So you don't even need to call your medical director before initiating bup. If you want to expand your scope, you can get the training as a paramedic and you can determine that somebody needs buprenorphine and start them in the field and then you don't even have to take them to the hospital. And that alleviates the load on, on, on the hospital, on the doctors that are involved, 
And on the system, it really relieves some of the pressure on that system. And so far in, this, in the, um, the areas in California where this has been rolled out, it's going really well. And we have some friends in Virginia that are doing the same thing. And there's a number of services on the East Coast where this is becoming standard practice and they're heading to offline medical direction as well. So in conclusion, our vision is that patients that are experiencing opioid use disorder, withdrawal, and overdose are offered MAT, low threshold MAT, right in the emergency department and connected to ongoing services after that crisis has been stabilized. Uh, we also want to see and continue to promote that message of signs and staff and the hospital environment promoting uh, self-disclosure from patients that it's an environment where they feel safe saying, hey, I, I, this isn't going well for me and I want to talk to you about, about treatment for substance use disorder. And the last thing is you know, that we have hospital champions that continue to build and advocate for and expand the pathways to patients who are looking for treatment for opioid and substance use disorder. Because as I said, it's so easy, a paramedic can do it. <clears throat> and so our goal is 24-7 uh, access to MAT and EDs in every state in the country by 2027. And this is actually an out-of-date map. I didn't have time to make a new one. So this was as of last summer. We've actually um, worked in a number of states since then. So the dark gray, these are states where we've done trainings and technical assistance. And the blue are states where we've done intensive um, uh, training programs where we've worked with sites and done and helped them to develop an SUD committee and develop a, a site-wide program to, to do um, ED buke. And uh, we've, since this was made, we've also worked here in, um, in Nevada with, with Kelly um, and in Illinois, Montana, uh, a, a number of East Coast states. So we're getting there and we would really love if you all would join us. And that's all I have. If you want any of those resources that were up on the screen, this QR code will take you there. And I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you very much.